Okay, welcome everyone. So CPR week two, CPR one week two. Um, we're going back into cardiac physiology heavily. So Sarah's gonna cover the first bit and we will then proceed with the other major topics that you guys um, covered this week. So make sure you guys are ready. Um, these slides are posted to our Facebook page, which is Sparkles and here's the T. If you guys need links to those groups, the um, QR code for that is here. These are QR codes for the Facebook pages, not for your OPLG or any of your AEP requirements. Please do not scan those thinking that you're gonna give you extra credit or attendance points, okay? Just wanna put that out there like Sarah said before. That being said, let's get started. Okay. So we just thought we'd throw in some of the review slides from last week's stuff, just so that you guys have them for your reference. So this is just showing you like the flow of blood so that when you're talking about the physiology, you can kind of conceptualize what the next step in the process is going to be. So if we're talking like, like left ventricle, you know that it's going into the systemic circulation. If we're talking right atrium, you know that it's coming from the systemic circulation from the venous part. Okay. Um, and then I think the next slide just has like your formulas on here. One of the things that is like kind of difficult for people to grasp is just because these are the formulas that you guys are given doesn't mean you don't have to work with the formulas and kind of like interchange all of them. So if I give you stroke volume in the form of end diastolic and end systolic volume, that doesn't mean you can't calculate stroke volume in other ways. So it's important to understand the definitions of all of these terms in order to be able to kind of like switch around the formulas. It's kind of like physics in undergrad. So just being able to do that will help you out a lot on the exam. That being said, the school is very understanding when we had our exam, they didn't give us too crazy of an equation, like, you know, going from ejection fraction all the way to like stroke volume, then going into like cardiac output. Like there wasn't like multiple levels of manipulation. They like definitely kept it at a level that is manageable, like one or two formulas combined. So don't get too flustered by that. Yeah, okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we're gonna start with your concepts over here. So preload. Preload is going to be talking about your filling pressure. So when we think preload, we're thinking left ventricle, and we're also thinking how much can that left ventricle hold? So how much can it stretch? How much pressure can it manage to hold? And uh, how much pressure can it handle? And then also how much volume can it manage to hold? So that's gonna be just kind of like your preload concept to keep in the back of your head. I'll go into more detail, and I think Kishore will also cover that concept. Um, and then afterload is going to be your um, arterial pressure that's going to be like opposing ejection. So if I'm going from my left ventricle out into the aorta, then I need to overcome the aortic pressure in order to influence that blood in the left ventricle to move out into the systemic circulation. And that's kind of your concept of afterload. And then contractility is going to be influenced by your sympathetic nervous system and then it's and also circulating agents but contractility is pretty much like how much of a contraction are you getting is it going to be a stronger contraction a weaker contraction and then you guys learned other things that are going to influence all of these aspects um, next slide please okay so let's start off with a question uh session id for turning point is in the corner sparkles t Okay, so I, as you guys are doing that, I'm just gonna kind of answer some of the questions I'm getting. So someone asked if we could go over ECG. The last bit of this presentation is going to be ECG slides. We're not going to go over them in too much detail because it wasn't as high yield on the exam as we expected it to be. So there are very basic ideas of ECG that we were tested on, like being able to recognize 
what the pattern you're seeing is. So we had like, I think something like VFib, VTAC, something like that. It was just pretty much recognition. The MEA, we spent so much time trying to learn how to calculate. It wasn't really that high yield on the exam at all. So we put in enough slides for you guys to be able to actually just read them and understand what you need to know and probably a little bit more, but we're not gonna actually go over those slides. But you, if you guys have questions at the end, we can talk about them. Okay, so we have most people saying D and that is the correct answer. So can we go to the next slide? Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> can we go back to that last slide? Okay, so if we're asking about preload and you wanna be able to get a good estimate of the preload, like I said, Preload is talking about how much that left ventricle can stretch, how much it can hold, and how much pressure it can handle. So your left ventricular and diastolic volume is going to be the best estimate of that because that's going to be the volume when you're at like max capacity in that left ventricle. So it's giving you that preload. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. Sorry, Kishore. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna introduce Frank Starling, but I believe Kishore has a slide that is actually going to talk about the curve. So Frank Starling is just kind of giving you what the heart's ability to adapt as in like stretch to increasing volumes of blood. So when we're talking about this, you wanna be able to recognize that this is a function of stroke volume on the Y axis and then end diastolic volume or preload on the X axis, because those are going to be interchangeable in most situations. So as you increase that end diastolic volume, you're increasing the stroke volume because you're giving yourself more blood in that left ventricle to eject out into the systemic circulation. And this is just the mechanism that it's talking about. So pretty much like if you're increasing the volume that's going into the left ventricle, then the sarcomeres of that left ventricular wall have to stretch to accommodate for that volume. And with that stretch, you're getting that increased stroke volume. So you guys do have to be able to recognize these concepts that are from, I believe, MSK, where we talked about contraction and how it works related to calcium. So if you're increasing your calcium sen sensitivity for your troponin C, then you're increasing your actin myosin interaction. And with that concept, if you guys remember, there's like a sweet spot with myosin and actin interactions where this is your optimal contraction, right? You have so many heads attached to that actin filament and that's gonna give you your ideal contraction. If you have not enough interaction, then that's going to represent like a low end diastolic volume. So if I don't have much blood in my left ventricle, then I'm not stretching it. So I'm not getting that much of a stroke volume because there's not enough stretch to recoil when you're contracting. For if there's too much, if you have too much stretch, if you guys remember, then the myosin and actin are too far apart for those interactions. So you get the same kind of idea where it's kind of like a loose rubber band where there's not going to be that elasticity that you expect okay and then so as the end diastolic volume is increasing obviously your preload is going to be increasing and your stroke volume is increasing okay let's go to the next slide okay again preload it's going to be changed by changing your edv and EDV and diastolic volume for anybody that does not know. Um, and then your afterload is gonna be changed by altering your aortic pressure because that's the pressure that you have to overcome in order to eject the blood. And then contractility is gonna be changed by altering either the sympathetic activity, giving it parasympathetic activity, or by drugs um, that are gonna alter the inotropic state. So you're gonna think contractility is related to inotropism. So drugs and then sympathetic, parasympathetic. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, pressure volume loops. You guys had this slide in our review last week, but now we can actually explain 
your other curves that are superimposed onto this graph. So this is your pressure volume loop shown here in black. And then depending on changing your contractility, your afterload or your preload, you're going to shift this graph in different ways. And that's a concept that you guys kind of have to understand where the easy way to understand this actually is just cap, okay? So if you look at the C or the contractility, right? This orange graph on the, sorry, let me get a laser pointer actually. That would probably be helpful. I can draw. Okay, so for contractility, you're looking at this graph because we're just looking at what is the difference between the normal pressure volume loop and what is happening with this. So you increase contractility, you get the C, right? And it's gonna be shifting it to the left. So if you think about this, you are decreasing that end systolic volume value and that end diastolic is staying the same. So if I'm calculating stroke volume, it's end diastolic minus end systolic. I have less of an end systolic volume, so I'm increasing my stroke volume. And that's kind of how you wanna approach each of these formulas. So whenever I see stroke volume, think about how it applies with all these concepts. Um, your ejection fraction is going to also increase because you have more blood in that ventricle. For the end systolic volume, like we said, it's decreasing. With your afterload, that's your A. And if you look very, very carefully, you can kind of see an interesting A shape here. So you are increasing it upwards. And so increasing your afterload, you're increasing that aortic pressure, decreasing stroke volume, because my end diastolic, again, is pretty much the same. I know that like if you guys go to Dr. Salito's office hours, he's going to tell you it looks kind of like this but that's good enough for the exam. You don't really have to like understand that part. Um, okay. But we are looking at our end systolic volume here. So my end systolic volume increased by a lot. So now if I'm trying to calculate that stroke volume, I'm subtracting my EDV from my ESV and I'm getting less of a stroke volume. And then for the third one, that is our P. So it comes out to the right. <laughs> and that's going to be representing an increase in end diastolic volume. Your end systolic should remain about the same. So you are increasing your stroke volume. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Can we go to the next slide, Kishkar? Thank you. Okay, let's do a question. Sorry, answering a question in the chat. Um, so I got a question that says, so increasing the afterload causes no change in end diastolic volume. According to SGU and what you guys have learned, it should be yes. If your electrolytes say anything different, go with that. But it's, um, I think it should be, it does not change the end diastolic volume. Um, okay. Great, so we got a majority of people saying stroke volume. This question is asking during exercise in cardiac transplant patients, cardiac output increases primarily due to an increase in which of the following? And that's another concept that you guys wanna be able to understand where, can I see the next slide just to see if I have an explanation on this? Okay, yeah, this works. So for cardiac output, can someone tell me what the formula for cardiac output is? Stroke volume times heart rate. 
stroke volume times heart rate, exactly. And in that question, heart rate was an option, but when we're talking about exercise, exercise is going to give you this pathway, right? So you're exercising, you're increasing your sympathetic activity. By that, you're increasing your venomotor tone, which is gonna increase your venous return into the right atrium, and it's gonna end up increasing that end diastolic volume. If you have more blood coming into the right atrium, it has to all end up in the left ventricle. So you're increasing that EDV, you increase preload, and preload is going to be an increase in stroke volume and also contractility. So that's why for this question, your better answer is your stroke volume instead of your heart rate, because heart rate is not really directly going to apply to this concept. Okay, go to the next slide. Oh, okay, so I just got a message from somebody saying that Dr. Boudot actually said, yes, that you guys are recognizing that there's a very small increase in EDV, sorry. So for our term, it was something that Dr. Toledo brought up and we were told to just follow our slides. But since she did clarify that concept for you guys, just know that it's a small enough increase where it's still going to show you those same trends that you saw on there. So if it said increase in stroke volume, you increase in stroke volume. But that increase in end diastolic volume is very minimal. Okay. For heart sounds. So we talked about your S3 and S4 last week. Um, S3 is going to be normal until about 35 years old, and then it can become pathological. So if you hear it in an older patient, then it would be considered a pathological heart sound. Um, this is just to remind you guys to remember these terms because I definitely did not remember them and probably should have. So your S3, the sound analogy is Kentucky Gallup. Don't ask me what that means. I have absolutely no idea. For your S4, that's gonna be Tennessee. Again, no clue what that means, but just <laughs> remember it for your exam and then you'll probably never have to remember it again. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next slide. I think Kentucky Gallup has to do with like horse racing. Yeah, I don't really know what it sounds like exactly, but yeah, just remember Kentucky Gallup. <laughs> okay, so for your heart murmurs, I know we went over this, but you guys kind of had this concept talked about in a lot of your lectures. So it's very important to be able to apply it to your all the lectures, right? So a stenosis is gonna be a valve that's opened and narrowed. So if you have narrowing of the valve, I like to look at it as vasoconstriction. If I have constriction, less stuff can get through it, right? But you have higher pressure before it, because if I have a small tube, but before that is a bigger tube or a ventricle, then I'm giving you a lot of volume into a very small location. So my pressure is going to be much, much higher. And then for incompetence, regurgitation, I think insufficiency those are all the same thing and that just means there's a closed valve but it's closed and leaking so if i have a closed mitral valve that i have blood leaking from my atria to my ventricle so just be able to understand like what these terms mean and then try to apply them to the clinical correlates that we're going to go over right now uh, next slide Okay, let's start with a question. Okay, 
So a majority of you guys are saying A, and that is the correct answer. And this is very buzzwordy. You guys will have to be able to kind of recognize aortic regurgitation, stenosis, the mitral prolapse, all that in different ways, but a lot of it is going to be buzzwordy. So if I know that I'm going to hear a diastolic murmur over the left sternal border, and then that's going to be telling me I'm talking about aortic regurgitation, and the next slide should show why that is. Yes. Okay. So I kind of tried to take all the concepts that refer to aortic regurgitation and throw them all on one slide so that you guys don't have to keep referring back to like all these different lectures. So with your aortic regurgitation, here you have that top part of that Wiggers diagram to show you what's going on here and then your PV loop. So be able to understand these PV loops, you guys. It's so important. So for aortic regurgitation, can someone explain to me what is going on in aortic regurgitation? It doesn't have to be super complex, just kind of generally what's happening. I saw volumetric is gonna be disturbed. A plus, yes. uh, plus we're gonna have the rapid aortic pressure will drop in diastolic. So this one is going to be increase in end diastolic volume. Um, with aortic regurgitation, you have that you pump the blood into the aorta, correct? And then now it is coming back into that left ventricle. So we have no real isovolumetric phase because you have blood leaking between valves. So if I don't have a complete closure, of the system, I can't have an isovolumetric phase. And so you're gonna see that increase in end diastolic volume. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to get this annotate feature. <laughs> okay, so you have that increase in end diastolic volume over here. And then by just that subtraction, you're gonna see an increase in end in stroke volume. And this is, kind of telling you that you don't have these clear boundaries between the phases, where in a regular pressure volume loop, you have these four kind of like aspects of it. And here it's kind of all a blur because you're not getting real isovolumetric phases. And then also be able to recognize that when we're talking about a diastolic heart murmur, then we're talking about something that's happening in this region where with systolic, you're talking about something that's happening in this region. So you wanna be able to recognize those so that you can see, okay, if I have aortic regurgitation, I'm not looking for something that's happening between S1 and S2. I'm looking for something that's happening in that diastolic phase when we have filling. Okay, and then here you have your buzzwords at the bottom, high-pitched, blowing, early diastolic, decrescendo murmur, those are all going to come up so many times. So just make sure you guys are memorizing all of the buzzwords for these uh, murmurs and valve issues. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, let's do another question. One sec. Okay, so we're kind of split on this one. Again, super buzzwordy. So we're reading this question and we're thinking, okay, auscultation reveals holosystolic apex 
uh, holosystolic murmur at the left fifth intercostal space. So what valve are we talking about if we're saying left fifth intercostal space midclavicular? Your mitral. mitral. Mitral, exactly. So with your mitral valve, it says the murmur is loudest at the apex, radiates to the axilla. Uh, that's also just more buzzwords for mitral. Um, and then it's enhanced during expiration. This part is going to be important when we get to that next slide because we kind of got thrown off on our exam, but we don't want that to happen to you guys. So can we go to that next slide? Yes. Okay, mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. No one ever talks about tricuspid regurgitation, except when it comes to the exam. So make sure you guys understand what a tricuspid regurgitation is. Um, the difference that you're going to hear is mitral is going to be louder on expiration, where tricuspid, I believe, should be louder on inspiration. That's how I differentiated them. It did help me out on the exam, um, but I'm not sure if you guys need to know more than that. It wasn't really covered, but just be familiar with a tricuspid regurgitation. Also, be familiar with your pulmonary valve because they don't talk about that one either. So with your mitral regurgitation, the one that we were just talking about, that's going to be where you have that holosystolic, high-pitched, blowing murmur. Again, buzzwords. Make sure you know them. Um, and then, so that one is loudest at the apex, radiates towards the axilla. Again, very buzzwordy. Just make sure you know those. Um, and then the mitral regurgitation is going to be usually due to ischemic heart disease. Um, and then there's also some other things. So if you have mitral valve prolapse or left ventricular dilation, that's going to also cause the same thing. And here again, no real isovolumetric phase because instead of these clean lines that we would expect in a PV loop, now you just kind of have this blob because regurgitation means leaky valves. So because of this, you have leaky valves. So in that systolic phase, you're not getting the same end systolic volume you would expect because you have things leaking. So it's less of an end systolic volume. And that's going to be because you have decreased resistance and increased regurgitation into the left atria during systole. So you're also going to get an increase in end diastolic volume because if you have more blood, you're going to get more of an end diastolic volume because it has to go somewhere and it has to all end up in that left ventricle. So if I'm increasing my end diastolic volume by more than I'm decreasing my end systolic volume, you're, you're going to get an increased stroke volume. And again, just that formula should always just be kind of in the back of your head. Um, and then for tricuspid, again, loudest at the tricuspid area. And the it's usually going to be right ventricular dilation. And if you think about where the tricuspid valve is, it makes sense. And rheumatic fever is going to be a buzzword for these. So rheumatic fever, I believe you guys are going to talk about it a little bit in a small group. Um, make sure you guys understand why rheumatic fever or how rheumatic fever um, is incorporated into that concept. I remember writing it out. I don't remember what it actually is, but just like try to look it up before that small group or something. I'm getting so many questions in the chat, sorry. <laughs> Can you repeat which is louder on which? Sorry, can we go back to that slide just so I can answer that question? Um, okay, so the louder for mitral versus tricuspid, mitral is loudest at the apex of the heart and then it's gonna radiate towards the axilla. So towards like your shoulder. Um, for tricuspid, it's loudest in the tricuspid area. So tricuspid is your right heart. So it's gonna be louder in your right heart area. Um, and then, oh, thank you for reminding me whoever just sent that message. So over here on this Wiggers diagram, you have this left atrium. Your left atrial pressure is extremely high here. That's your V wave. And the only way you would know that is if you looked at that Wiggers diagram really carefully. So that increased V wave is why the answer to that last question was E. And then can we go back and see? Yeah, 
so increased V wave. And that is just, again, something you have to memorize. I believe in first aid when they show the Wiggers diagram on that next slide, it has it labeled as you have an increased V wave in your mitral regurgitation. So again, that's just something that you would have to just memorize for this one. Okay, let's go to the next question. No problem. Okay, so we're split on this one. For your um, systolic murmur over, it, they already told you which pathology this is. So this is aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis meaning, meaning that you have less of an opening in that aortic valve where less blood can get from your left ventricle into your aorta. So if I have stenosis of the aorta, I'm getting less blood flowing into that um, systemic circulation at the high pressure. So because of that, you would feel a decreased pulse pressure. I don't know why it says pressure twice, but decreased pulse pressure. <laughs> um, and then the next slide should explain a little further. Okay, so with your aortic stenosis, I'm narrowing that valve. And so I'm going to get less blood being ejected and also less blood just getting to the systemic circulation. So I'm increasing my end systolic volume. I am slightly increasing that end diastolic volume and my afterload is increasing so much because narrow valve means a lot of pressure to overcome in order to get the blood out. So decreasing that left ventricular pressure and I'm sorry, increasing that left ventricular pressure, increasing the end systolic volume, like we just showed, no real change in EDV, but it is mild. So again, I believe we're recognizing it as a small change in end diastolic volume, according to the lectures. So we're going to go with that. And then because I'm getting a very small increase in end diastolic volume and quite a larger increase in end systolic volume, I'm decreasing my stroke volume. So you can look at it conceptually, you can look at it mathematically, whatever works for you. I'm more of a mathematical type of person. So usually just looking at the math is enough for me. Um, and then ventricular hypertrophy would decrease the ventricular compliance. So if I have thickening of that left ventricle wall, then I am going to have less of an ability to stretch it. And so I'm going to increase that end diastolic pressure for the end diastolic volume. So sorry, are people answering the questions in the chat? Because I'm getting a lot. Uh, if you guys could actually um, message either Armon or Kishore, because I can't see this while I'm presenting. Um, and then, so for your actual murmur, you're going to expect, this is a systolic one. So again, it's between that S1 and S2, and that's where you would expect to hear it. You wouldn't expect to hear it in that diastolic area. So it's gonna be crescendo, decrescendo, where it gets loud, it gets quiet. Like that's literally how you're looking at it. And then it's gonna be a soft S2, and that's because you have a stenotic valve. So the closure of the valve is going to be quiet. And your left ventricular pressure is greater than your aortic pressure during systole. And that's because, again, you have a stenotic valve, less of an opening for it to go through. So you're building up pressure in that left ventricle. OK. And then again, go through these in more detail on your own time, but just for like these questions specifically. OK. I'm going to next one. Okay.
Okay, so let's see how we did on this one. So most people are giving me that answer of B. So again, we would not expect an extra sound during systole because when we're talking about mitral stenosis, this is going to be pre-systolic, correct? Yeah, we're all familiar with that. Okay, so on the next slide, it'll kind of show it to you in the description. So again, systole is this area over here. So we wouldn't hear a sound during systole, an extra sound, because this is not even happening during systole. This is happening during diastole. So with that question, that one should have been pretty straightforward. Um, and then for this PV loop with mitral stenosis, again, you have a narrowing of the mitral valve this time. So we're going to have decrease and systolic volume, a decrease and diastolic volume because your mitral valve is separating which two chambers? Who can I, who can answer that? Your left um, atrium, the ventricle. Left atrium, left, left ventricle, yes. Okay, so if I am narrowing that opening between my left atrium and my left ventricle, then less blood is coming into my left ventricle or at a slower rate than if it were a normal functioning valve. So because of that, I have less of an end diastolic volume just because it can't really get into there as fast or as efficiently as it normally would. And so you're going to increase that left atrial pressure because I have all of this blood that's backed up into the left atrium that can't really get into the left ventricle. And that's also going to give you that decreased end systolic volume. And then by decreasing all of these factors, you're getting a decreased stroke volume. So with your mitral stenosis, you're going to be looking for delayed rumbling mid to late diastolic murmur. That's going to be your buzzwords for this one. Um, and then this one can also be associated with rheumatic fever. So just be able to recognize which ones are associated with rheumatic fever and how that works. Okay. So again, this should have just been kind of like an intro, how to orient yourself with these different pathologies, but it, I didn't cover everything obviously, because there are a lot of different concepts that play into this. So just on your time, hopefully this kind of geared you towards which direction to go in with studying this stuff. Okay. And then, so I wanted to throw this in here just to show you guys which valve you're trying to auscultate. And then underneath each valve, it tells you what you expect to hear there. So in the pulmonic area, we would expect systolic ejection murmurs, and that's your pulmonic stenosis. So obviously, like if your pulmonic area, you're listening to the pulmonary valve. And then atrial septal defect, flow murmur. Flow murmur is something that's mentioned in all of these um, I wouldn't really pay too much attention to that one unless it's uh, mentioned specifically in one of your lectures. But just kind of go through this and understand like, okay, mitral area is going to give me mitral regurgitation, mitral stenosis, mitral valve prolapse. So this is just recognizing, making sure you checked all the boxes for the pathologies you need to know. Okay. And then here's a table from the end of your actual lecture slides, just to make sure I didn't miss anything with uh, the pictures that I thought were prettier. So here, just to make sure that you guys don't miss anything. So your diastole, which murmurs are in the diastole phase, which murmurs are in the systole phase, what do they sound like, pansystolic decrescendo. And I believe there's a link on one of your slides that sends you to a, a video to hear these actual murmurs do that. One of the upper term is suggested to us to listen to them every night before you go to bed. You don't need to go that far into it. Just listen to them to the point where you understand why they call it crescendo decrescendo. Understand why it's an opening snap. Like try to hear the differences between all of these and that should be more than enough for you guys. Okay, the next slide. Oh, and I'm out. Kishore. <laughs> Okay, so now that I'm taking over this portion, I do apologize. There was a barrage of different messages in the chat. I couldn't get to all of them. Um, 
feel free to direct your messages now to Sarah and Armand, et cetera, and we can kind of take it from there or put it generally so that someone else could help you guys with that concept or it's something that you're struggling with because I'm not keeping an eye on the chat right now. Okay, hemodynamics. So this lecture, um, I kind of wanted to make sure you guys cover and there, there isn't too many crazy things with it, but there are a few kind of pinpoint details that you guys need to know. Okay, first thing, uh, Pasuli's law, and that primarily just deals with resistance. So it's a very simplified concept. You guys don't need to calculate it. It's not, it doesn't get too crazy with this. There are a couple of things that you do need to calculate later on. I will pinpoint those. Here, you just need to know decrease radius or constriction of any kind is going to contribute to increased resistance. And this naturally makes sense with the question that I'm going to ask you guys next, which is which allows the system to have a lowest resistance? Which part here? The parallel systems so like the organs. Exactly. So now I can talk all I want about this, but explain to me why we would want a low resistance here in the organs. Give me a nice overview. Why why would we need um, you know low resistance in at the organs, guys? For perfusion. Yes, perfusion. It tends to be the answer for most things with organs, right? It allows for a greater amount of time for perfusion, exchange of nutrients, like Cynthia put in the chat. So just be aware of that and know that this is going to be a major factor, right? Low resistance organs, right? Think about it that way. Parallel systems are, are contributing to that low resistance. And if it's in a series, you're thinking about your major vessels, right? Your major vessels that are bringing blood in towards the organs, and then eventually it gets into your arterioles and then eventually into your um, capillaries and then eventually back into your venules and veins, et cetera, okay? Now, arrangement of blood vessels in each organ is very important, right? Think about it. This is the natural order of things. First order arterioles, second order arterioles, and then finally you get to your capillaries. Um, remember here, total resistance is equal to the sum of individual components, right? Whether this is a sum that you're seeing here, or if it's one over the resistance, it's all going to be important. They won't ask you to get too crazy with this and ask you to calculate it. But what you do need to know is the general concept. Within each organ, the resistance is in a series. However, the capillary networks are regarded in a parallel network. And that's why you allow that, that's why you give time for proper perfusion and exchange of nutrients, material, and waste products. We're going to get into the concept that you guys actually need to know, and that's tested, which is resistance and pressure and flow. What you need to know is that the thing that's primarily contributing to total peripheral resistance is your arterioles. Now, if we're talking about your arterioles, what side of the heart are we likely talking about? Is it the left side or the right side with your whole systems of blood? Left side. Left-sided heart, right? And think about it that way. I really like to take the heart and dissect it into two, left side of the heart versus the right side of the heart. So arterioles are providing your total peripheral resistance. Veins provide the largest storage capacity for your blood. So think about it. Now, if we're talking about veins, which side are we talking about? Left side or right side? Right side. Right Sorry? Side. right side, absolutely, okay? If you guys have that general concept, you should be good with this. This is the broad concept you need to know. They don't ask you to end up calculating all of this because no physician in their right mind would eventually do this. But what you do need to know is the viscosity depending on hematocrit, viscosity depending on like hyperprotein states, like if, you're not, like if you have some kind of liver disorders could also cause like hypo. Um, so just be aware of these things and you should be good, right? Okay. Microcirculation. This was the DLA that a lot of folks ignored and it tended to come back and bite them in the butt. So microcirculation, what are the key definitions you need to know? Hydrostatic pressure, right, is the capillary pressure that drives fluid out from the capillaries into the interstitial space. Whereas oncotic pressure is what keeps the fluid from the capillaries and drives reabsorption, right? These two definitions you have to know very well because they will ask you questions about this based off of the next series of questions. 
Let's do this one. Okay, so majority of you guys are absolutely correct. It's a high capillary hydrostatic pressure. So let's kind of dissect this. So complaints of shortness of breath, peripheral edema, irregular heartbeat. So you got to start dissecting those, right? Peripheral edema, what side of the heart are we talking about? Like shortness of breath, what side of the heart are we talking about? All of those things you will expand on. So you do need to read these question stems very carefully. Um, the laboratory study shows normal liver function. That's going to eventually come back, and you guys are going to learn more about that. Um, has a history of hypertension and coronary heart disease. That's the biggest thing. The patient says he's been experiencing these symptoms for the past week and is being progressively getting worse, applying the Starling. Okay. What is the greatest rule? It's high capillary hydrostatic pressure. This is the force that is basically pushing out all of the fluid, right, in your blood, in not like all of the everything in your blood, but a good amount of it is going to the tissues. And in the tissues, it's then basically sitting there, which is what edema is in a nutshell. So we'll kind of go through all of this and we will work through it. Net filtration pressure is a formula you need to know like the back of your head, right? What are each of these, you know, symbols or definitions that what what do they stand for what does pc stand for it's the capillary hydrostatic pressure it's basically the force that pushes the fluids out from the capillaries whereas pif or pi some people like to say just pi is the interstitial hydrostatic pressure it's pushes the fluid into the capillaries. So you've got to contrast these two. The P and P go together and the pi and pi go together. That's how I kept it straight and I kept that formula you know, straight in my head. Um, plasma oncotic pressure is this one, right? Pi C and then pi I, which is interstitial fluid oncotic pressure. Know these very well, as well as K and um, the reflection factor here. Those, they will tend to give you, and people will often forget to include them in the formula, and they will end up messing it up. What you need to know is you have to practice these questions. You guys were assigned practice questions in um, your kind of Sakai material, so make sure you guys do those, and they will ask you to calculate those. What you need to know generally is that positive sign filtration has taken place, whereas a negative sign absorption has taken place. And if you know that, you're going to be pretty much solid on these because a lot of people were able to calculate this. They just weren't able to define what was happening. Is more fluid going out or more fluid coming in to the capillaries? Okay. Let's go Oh, to this one. Okay. So this is the first aid picture and it kind of shows you in terms of arrows how fluid is moving through. Now, I want to ask you guys, and I've been talking for a while about this, but what would allow for more things to be pulled in? What forces allow for things to be pulled into the capillaries? Albumin, absolutely, right? The proteins and the plasma content is allowing for things to come back in, right? That's important. If you have any sort of liver disorder where it's knocking out albumin function or you know, overall production of certain proteins, you're going to end up presenting with ascites, um, potential edema, so many different things. So just be aware, they can really play with these concepts, not just based off of the cardiac system, but potentially systems you guys have yet to fully cover, which is like liver functions and other things, um, which you guys are gonna cover this week too with proteins, um, clotting and all these other things. Cool. Let's go over the couple of important concepts you guys need to know with edema, right? Hydrostatic pressure, that's the fluid uh, being driven out into the interstitial space. There's two types that you need to be aware of. 
pulmonary edema versus peripheral edema. Pulmonary lungs, right? It's slight increase in hydrostatic pressure in the lung capillaries, which is forcing all of the uh, all of the contents from the capillary to be basically pushed into the lungs, aka the patient is going to have a hard time breathing, and gas exchange, and all those things are going to be messed up. Whereas peripheral edema is an increase in the systemic capillary pressure, which is basically going to cause, like you know, you'll see the patient's going to come in. You can, basically test the level of edema. If you guys go to your small group and you'll see for sure, they're going to tell you levels that are normal of how much edema is, you know, presenting with these things. Now, what is the difference? Pulmonary edema versus the um, peripheral edema, which side of the heart is likely messed up, guys? Is it the right versus the left? What is, which one is messed up for pulmonary? going to be your right left. pulmonary left okay left it's fluid in your lungs okay so left because think about it if you have any sort of back or sorry any sort of issues in the left side things aren't going to be naturally able to come back into the heart and eventually get pumped out for circulation so it just causes a buildup and the blood or anything else pools and stays longer in the lungs so more things can get passed on to the lungs and causing edema. Whereas peripheral edema is associated with what side? The right. The right. Right, absolutely. Keep that straight, guys. A lot of people, they were like, oh yeah, this was a DLA, like we learned this, we were fine. But they missed, missed these questions just based off of the fact that the patient presented with pulmonary edema versus peripheral edema. And surprisingly, they asked us more so about the um, <laughs> peripheral edema, which is like the right heart issues, where we spend so much copious amounts of time on the left side. Oncotic pressure, what you guys need to know with these is any sort of issue with proteins, right? Any plasma protein that's messed up, you're basically gonna have changes to the oncotic pressure. Of course, capillary walls dealing with inflammation, ischemia, and all these things, not too much. You guys won't get into that until like term two and potentially even term four. Lymphatic drainage, those you guys won't cover too much until you get to your lymphatic section um, and as well as your immune section. Okay, this is what I was testing you guys on. You guys absolutely knew it. Um, what you do need to know is these two, they don't get too crazy with the hepatic stuff. So just be aware of that. That's very much a um, term two thing. So they might throw one question on like if you have decreased proteins but that's it. They won't ask you like what's hepatic fibrosis or anything like that. Cool. Let's go to cardiac output. Now, once again, the key concept with this is that preload is going to deal with what side of the heart, guys? Left. I can see why you would say left, but it's mostly it's dealing right. with the right. Yeah, because it's the return back to the heart, right? You've gone through systemic circulation from your, your wonderful left atrium to your left ventricle, and then finally into your aortic, you know, then systemic circulation. But your key concept here is that a lot of your preload concepts are going to be dealing with your right heart, right? And someone messaged me earlier and they were asking me, what is CVP? Can someone answer me what CVP is? Central venous pressure. Central venous pressure. Now, this is a very important concept because it, it tripped up a lot of people. They were like, oh, we were in the veins. Why are, we, why are we in the veins? But your CVP can actually be measured in the right atrium. It's the amount of blood that essentially is returning back to the right side of your heart. So, it's critical that you guys know that it's dealing with, of course, preload, right atrial um, pressure is gonna be important. So just think of this synonymous, uh, syn <laughs> synonymous with um, RAP, okay? Let's move right on, right along with this stuff. Factors that affect VR, right? What is VR? Venous return, guys, okay? It's important that you guys know that Venomotor constriction is really important because it deals with a, a lot with your symp sympathetics, right? When your sympathetics are kicked in, it's going to cause venoconstriction, right? Which is going to decrease compliance, right? And eventually going to result in blood returning back 
to the heart. Because what did I tell you? Where is most of our blood hanging out when um, it's not just circulating through and through? Our venous system. Our venous system. Think about it, guys. There is a lot of questions about like compliance and all of those things because your veins are distendable. They can basically expand and allow for blood to basically hang out. When they do need to return, the sympathetic influence is basically constricting it, causing more blood to be pushed back towards the heart. And that's going to increase what? Not only your venous return, but also your preload, right? And then preload being increased is then going to change cardiac output. So tie those concepts together and know these very well, okay? Sympathetics, increased venous return, increase in end diastolic volume, which is then going to cause a whole series of other things. So you guys are probably wondering, okay, these are concepts I get, but how are they going to test me? They can test you guys on these by putting these charts. These charts have up and down arrows, and you have to know the parameters for each of those lines or sorry, rows. And they can tell you, okay, like what's happening if the sympathetic response is activated in the venous side, you'd have to say both VR is venous return is elevated uh, or sorry, increased as well as end diastolic volume. And then they can ask you a question on is cardiac output going to be increased, decreased? So they can play around with these a lot. Now let's go to arterioles. Arterioles are primarily dealing with your left side of the heart, right? Left sided heart, this is going to be important, but think about it this way. If you have arterial constriction, are you going to have increased venous return or decreased venous return? have decreased? Decreased. Think about it this way, right? You constrict the amount of blood that's eventually going to go into the capillaries and eventually back into the veins. Because remember, VR starts for venous return. So we haven't gotten to the veins yet. So you're kind of occluding it early on or decreasing it. So less amount of blood is allowed to return back to the heart. So think about it that way and you can kind of run through this. So what you do need to know is that this is left-sided. So total peripheral resistance is going to be increased with arterial veno, um, vasoconstriction, sorry, not venoconstriction, vasoconstriction, that's gonna cause a decrease in venous return, but you can have the opposite where you could have um, arterial vasodilation, which then would decrease total peripheral resistance and eventually get back to blood flow to the venous system and then blood flow from the venous system can go back to the heart, okay? Just think of these two things in left-sided, right-sided heart, and you're gonna be pretty much good. Okay, this sets us up for the vascular function curve. So you guys know these curves very well. I don't wanna to spend too much time on them, but what you do need to know is that where is the normal value for RAP? What is RAP again? All right, atrial fibrillation. Correct, and what's the value that we need that's normal? Two. Positive, oh, two. Positive two, nice, okay. That's the essential bit, okay? Then they can start messing with the parameters, okay? You can have increased blood volume. Let's say you're starting to give your patient increased fluids because you know he's dehydrated and you need to make sure he's getting back to like normal homeostasis, but you gotta taper it to a right level, right? You can't just flood him with a bunch of fluids and then assume that he's gonna be fine. That can mess with potentially the amount of blood that's returning, because remember you're adding volume to the blood and that can mess up potentially with the cardiac functions too. So that's why the amount of IV fluids that often is given is very tightly regulated, okay? Blood volume, you can also have a decreased blood volume such as with hemorrhages. So just run through this process, okay? What would you think, right? Without looking at the cardiac component of this, it's not even shown here, Let's say you're hemorrhaging. Do you think you'll have increased venous return? No, no right? It'd be decreased. So decreased blood volume. So if you kind of keep it that simple, you're not going to get too tripped up with this side of the curve. So this is like the um, essential of what you need to know. Now, getting back to our venomotor functions, okay? Um, if you have increased venous constriction, that's going to increase, you know, like uh, the amount of blood that's returning back to the heart, same process, it's going to be, you know, amount of blood that's entering back to the heart is going to be increased. Whereas dilation, more blood or distension of the venous system, it's going to allow for more blood to pool and aka the compliance is going to be great, but the problem is the blood is just going to stagnate and pool at that site. Um, and then you can talk about 
like how you have decreased um, venous return and all these things. Now, this is essential. Increase afterload, less blood ejected. So larger end systolic volume, right? Increased ionotropies, um, ionotropies would reduce end systolic volume with negative sign, right? Like you can basically go through this whole like logical process, right? This is a kind of a pre decision tree that you can kind of run through. Overall, the large ESV then um, would lead to a smaller SV stroke volume with a negative blue sign that you're seeing right there, okay? This is sets you guys up for the Frank Starling kind of curve, as well as um, I think a couple of the Guyton cross plots that you're going to see. Okay. Now, Starling curve. This is important, right? When you have something going wrong, right? Like, let's say your, you know, your heart failed one fine day. Obviously, it's not completely gone, but it's going to have increased contractility or decreased contractility if you have heart failure decreased. Awesome. So it's going to be decreased. What that means is you got to give some kind of positive ionotropes to basically boost back its contractility functions so that it can kind of kick back up. But remember, it's never going to reach back to normal because it's going to be, it's, it's not working to its full capacity. And you have a full blown heart failure. It's right here. So whereas with exercise, it's the opposite swing of the pendulum, right? Remember, stroke volume is going to go up. The preload is going to go up because remember what happens at the sympathetics of um, with sympathetics with the venomotor system. Is it going to vasoconstrict or um, not vasoconstrict? Is it going to venoconstrict or venodilate? Venoconstrict. Venoconstrict. So you're going to increase your preload, um, and at the same time, your sympathetic innervation to the heart, right? It's going to be dealing a lot with your ventricle system, and that's going to deal with a greater amount of oomph or the stroke volume and the amount of blood that's eventually ejected. So it's a nice complete circle. It's the normal, but it's the normal now set to a, a higher degree. That's what exercise is. And it's a very good thing. It allows for our heart to kind of function at, at a better optimal kind of capacity. That's why, you know, we should exercise, unlike me. Moving right along, cardiac performance curve versus the vascular function curve. Important, these plots messed up a lot of people because they were just like, oh yeah, like I get the concept, but what you guys have to make sure is the deviation from the concepts, right? So here is the cardiac performance curve. This is the one that we guys spent less time on, but the vascular function I spent more time on, so you guys should have a kind of a rough grasp. Okay, so any sort of change to this, the other side will have to compensate. Any sort of change here, the other side will have to compensate. If you have any sort of cardiac issue, the vascular kind of function curve has to work in opposite to basically boost up the cardiac function. And you'll, you're gonna go through examples with this and they were concepts we were tested on, okay? Effect of cardiac failure, right, on the Guyton cross plot go through this process, run through it step by step. This is your normal function curve, right? Look, we're at plus two. Now your heart has failed, okay? So what's gonna happen? It's not functioning at its optimal capacity. So the cardiac function curve moves downward. What your venous system doing is still hasn't, it hasn't, de it hasn't compensated yet. So, it, so the venous return is gonna be less, right? Remember, the more you pump out, the more should return. It's a closed loop system. Your blood or any sort of fluid doesn't magically dissipate. It doesn't just disappear into thin air. It all follows physical parameters. So with a myo myocardial contraction being decreased, um, the set point moves from A to B. So decreased cardiac output um, and increased RAP, which is right atrial pressure. Okay. Let's move on to the compensation. So what does the compensation do? After the compensation, basically the set point moves from B that we, we saw with decompensated to a compensated, and that forces your heart, your cardiac output to slightly increase, right? Think about it, it's slight increase, but it's still a significant enough increase because you've heart, you've, you've, your heart has literally had a failure, right? It hasn't been functioning to it, it's not functioning to its full capacity. So, in, in layman's term, right, is cardiac compensation here with the uh, venous compensation a good thing? 
Is it a good thing long term or is it just a good thing short term? <laughs> short term, right? It's only good for the short run. If it continues to do this, your heart is going to work extra hard to kind of compensate for this as you are, you know, compensating with a Venus um, kind of function curve. It's going to eventually re lead to another kind of cardiac issue, right? A long term issue. So make sure you guys know that, that this is a short term thing that you don't want this to be prolonged or you will, your heart will legit give up at one point. So know these curve and know how it moves from decompensated to compensated and how you're going to see the slight increase in cardiac output after the compensation. Okay. Hemorrhage. Okay. Is hemorrhage working on the on the venous return or is it working on, sorry, the venous function curve or is it working on the cardiac output curve? Venous function curve. Venous function curve, absolutely. Because remember your blood volume is lost. There's a significant blood volume loss. So what your heart has to do is like, I mean, there, there are other factors like there are your bare receptors that are located both in the aortic body as well as the common carotid that are basically monitoring the situation and the blood flow and assessing, am I getting enough? Am I getting little? So it's important that you guys know that your heart will then work to compensate a sudden drop in blood volume, right? Such as what you would see with the hemorrhage. So quickly, it'll go from A to B, right? It's going to force an increase in contractility. And obviously this, this is kind of good because it preserves you for a while. But even then, if you're hemorrhaging, if it's a, like a, like an artery that's potentially, you know, cut or ruptured, then you're basically just going to keep pumping and pumping and pumping. And then you're going to get to a point you're basically bleeding out. So this is also another short-term thing, but it keeps you alive. So this is a nice kind of compensatory mechanism. So from normal to A and then to B, right? Contractility goes up. And that's why you guys are seeing the cardiac performance curve compensate for this. Exercise is a good thing. Now, a critical point, does RAP, right atrial pressure, change? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. That's critical. People miss that. They were like, oh yeah, you exercise, everything changes. Nope. RAP stays the same, okay? Because what happens is that it is a systematic change to every single component, right? Contractility goes up as well as venoconstriction. So your venous return is still there, right? It's, it's increased as well as you having increased cardiac contractility. So everything moves together. So RAP stays still at plus two, okay? Total peripheral resistance does not change significantly since there's a dilation in the skeletal muscle bed, which allows for you know proper perfusion and you can continue to maintain doing the activities that you need to with your skeletal muscles. Cool, let's do a question. I know this is a lot of talking, but make sure you guys know these well. Sorry, Kishore, real quick. Have you uploaded um, the presentation onto the drive? Not onto the drive, I just put it on our Facebook page for the time being. I will post okay. it with our recording. Here, I'm gonna post it right now because some people don't have Facebook and need slides. So I'll just post okay. it right now. Awesome. Thank you. You have the updated copy, right? Yeah, I just downloaded it off of Facebook. Thank you. Awesome guys, I'm glad you guys are getting this concept. You are absolutely correct. The popular answer D is absolutely true. Now, is this compensated or decompensated? Compensated, absolutely. Which point in here is not compensated or decompensated? Yes, C would C would work if it's a serious heart failure, but that 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 
that does work. B is also a good um, option too, okay? Nicely done, let's go over, oh, so here's a nice summary of the effects that it can kind of have based off of ionotropy, venous return, and total peripheral resistance. Make sure you guys keep these straight, okay? Ionotropy that likely deals with your drugs and some kind of modulation, both endogenously and exogenously, as well as venous return, that's more dealing with your right-sided heart, and then total peripheral resistance, left-sided heart. So make sure you guys know those as well as the examples, both in lecture and the first aid one kind of nicely summarizes it together, okay? Okay, this formula, I swear to God, you guys gotta know it very well, okay? We got like at least like a handful of questions on it and it was all playing around with this factor. But these changes, like the physiological changes are likely gonna be buried in the question step. Right, metabolic rate goes up, cardiac output has to be met in that same kind of situation, right? Sleep, same, um, it has to go down, right? You're less functional, it's like less energy demand, so cardiac um, output can be decreased. So make sure you guys know all of the potential scenarios as well as sympathetic and parasympathetic kind of systems and how they would play with the cardiac output, right? Cool. Um, and as well as your end uh, diastolic volume and systolic volume and knowing that it contributes to your stroke volume, okay? EDV, preload, contractility, talking about your anotropic state as well as your arterial pressure after, okay? All of those concepts are what Sarah covered, I covered. If, it, if it's mentioned like triple, quadruple number of times, it comes back in the, in the exam. Okay, coronary heart disease, ischemic diseases, you gotta know these because um, it's just likely cause and effect thing that they can likely test you on, right? If it's a progressive heart issue, then it's gonna lead to cardiac failure. You can have any sort of occlusion, such as with your LAD or um, any of your coronary arteries that can basically shut down your entire heart. And if it's shut down, you kind of are dead. So there are causes after, um, after atheromatous plaques in the coronary vessels, poor diet, genetic predispositions. They didn't get too crazy with those, but they will um, potentially give these in the question step. So you guys got to know the ischemic heart diseases and how they kind of present, whether it's sudden or progressive. Okay, drugs, you got to know, one, if there's a decreased oxygen demand, there's going to be decreased workload. So if there's decreased workload, then there's decreased contractility, preload and afterload. So it's like a, it's a whole family of things. They like to ask those tables where all of the arrows are given up and down. And then you have to distinguish between which one is the correct answer based off of the given situation. That's how they, they test these. Okay. They don't give you a nice question stem and tell you, is it, a, is workload increasing or decreasing? They, they always ask based off of these across the table um, questions. Anti-anginal drugs, what you do need to know is nitroglycerins, they cause venodilation. Okay. So if it's venodilation, are you going to have increased venous return? Decreased venous return. Absolutely. And then beta blockers can also work in that process. Remember, people can be in a combination of things, nitroglycerin, beta blockers. You'll learn more about that in term four. What happens is you, with beta blockers, you're basically knocking out um, their kind of a sympathetic components. So your heart rate goes down, contractility goes down. You can also give them potentially calcium channel blockers. And we'll go over the cardiac contractility based off of a little bit of the calcium channel blockers. Here's the kind of the mechanism. You guys kind of know your nitric oxide components because you guys covered it in FTM. Remember cyclic GMP and all of that process de deals with this entire thing. So um, yeah, quick question that I saw in the chat. I don't, I, I don't think I can kind of uh, get too crazy with this. Remember your venous system allows for most of the blood to hang out in the veins, right? and the venous system. Venodilation is basically expanding that vessel and allowing for more blood to basically pool. When you have venoconstriction, right, it's more blood returning back, okay? When you have vasodilation, right, vasodilation typically deals with your arterioles, right? Your arterioles are major contributors to this. Your arterioles, when they dilate, that allows for more blood to 
basically circulate through, um, get to your capillaries and then eventually back into your veins. And from the veins, it can have greater venous return. When you have vasoconstriction, right? The arterioles constrict, that means less blood is allowed to pass through and eventually get back to the heart. So that's how I run through those step-by-step, -step, okay? Veno, veins, vaso, art arteries. Thank you guys. Sorry, my apologies if I was switching those two up. Okay, let's move right along. Here is a, kind of a nice summary of one of the DLAs that you guys had on your autoregulators, lungs, heart, brains, and kidneys, and skeletal muscles. And remember there are local factors that control these, right? There are local metabolic demands and changes. What you do need to know for your skeletal muscle are these. It's called chalk, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, adenosine, lactate, and potassium. They contribute a lot when you are exercising to that venous return, as well as your um, cardiac output and the demands that is placed on your heart, okay? Let's move on to your hormonal regulators. These you guys gotta know, because this was something a lot of folks ignored because they were like, oh yeah, like histamine, bradykinins, like these are things that like we've learned in FTM. But remember, these have specific effects, right? Arterial dilation or plus venoconstriction, that's gonna cause increased capillary hydrostatic pressure and increased filtration is gonna lead to edema, right? So this is how they can test you on these based off of the increasing values, right? Bradykinins, okay? Filtration, edema also. Prostaglandins, there's a family of them. There's the prostacyclines, which deal with vasodilation. There's the E-series of uh, prostaglandins that deal with vasodilation as well. And then there's the F-series, all vasoconstriction, okay? These are on the next week's DLAs. Okay, make sure you guys still know them. Um, this These come back over and over, okay? Summary of the both the autonomics and the local and the mechanical regulators in these. This one was a straight up memorization thing. Um, once again, don't ignore this DLA. They did have stuff on microcirculation as well as autonomics having a big impact on like the brain as well as the pulmonary system. Most of it was on skeletal. They really like exercise for some reason, something that I get very less of, but still. Moving on to cardiac conductivity. I believe this is Sarah's territory. Okay, I tried to answer every single question in the chat. I don't know if I got everybody. I'm sorry if I didn't, but direct those questions to Kishore if I haven't answered your question. Yes. Um, okay, so for your auction potential lecture, pretty much all you really need to know is memorizing the different phases and which channels are opening and where the ions are flowing. So you have two graphs that you're going to focus on and that's pretty much all you really need to know for this lecture. So uh, the next slide, sorry, Kishore, you're doing a, lo a lot of things at one time, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, here's just gonna be a table for you guys to go over in your own time. It is in your lecture, but again, this is telling you where the channels are, what types of channels you have, um, what's flowing through them. And that's important to understand before you guys dive into the two different graphs. Okay, next slide. All right, let's go through this one. So this is going to be your uh, ventricular myocyte action potential graph. And we're starting at phase four. Sometimes they start at phase zero. It doesn't really matter as long as you know what's happening at which one. So for, let me get this annotate thing out of the way so I don't have to do this halfway through my explanation. Sorry, guys. Okay. All right. So if we're talking about your phase fours over here, you can see that this is pretty much where that resting membrane potential is going to be, right? So phase four is going to represent the opening of those potassium inward rectifier channels or delayed rectifiers, whatever they want to call it. Um, and that's pretty much just saying you're trying to maintain that resting potential. Because if I'm at this flat line at negative 85 millivolts, and the only thing that's moving is that potassium, then I'm trying to maintain that negative 85 millivolts. Nothing's happening with calcium, nothing's happening with sodium at this point. Once we get to that phase zero, that's gonna be the beginning of your rapid depolarization phase. 
So phase zero is going to signify opening of those sodium channels, a huge influx of sodium very rapidly, and that's gonna give you that steep increase representing your depolarization. With part one over here, or phase one, that's when you have those potassium transient outward channels that are going to uh, open up. So it's gonna give you rapid, deep, uh, rapid repolarization, but when we talked about your other action potential graphs, in, I believe in FTM1, we just had that, where you had potassium and sodium on the other side. So those are the only two factors you were considering. We're adding calcium to this mix. So those potassium channels are giving you a very small phase of rapid repolarization, and that's gonna be in response to that steep increase for that depolarization. So your voltage-gated potassium channels are open, your sodium channels are going to be inactivated now because we're repolarizing. Then you get to this part two here. They love asking about phase two. They also love asking about four because nobody really thinks about four. So just make sure you guys know all of these different phases. So for phase two, that's when your calcium comes in. Your L-type voltage-gated calcium channels open, and then you have calcium that's going to be flowing, and then potassium is also still flowing. So you're going to get this kind of opposing um, positive charge. So you have a positive charge from one end, a positive charge from the other end, and that's going to give you a plateau. So you're not really changing the voltage as much as if you just had potassium. You're not going to see a drastic decrease in this phase. And that's also called the plateau phase of the action potential. So just make sure you guys are familiar with that. So once it gets to like around zero over here, then the calcium channels are going to start to close and the potassium delayed rectifier channels are going to open now. And with those potassium delayed rectifying channels, you're gonna get the rest of that steep repolarization phase that you expected. And so then you end up back at four. That's literally all there is to it. Just know which channels are opening at which phase and why you're getting this trend that you're seeing. So pretty much all you really have to be able to explain is why I went from repolarization to plateau to more repolarization. Um, and then the clinical note that we have here is just going to be your L-type calcium channels are going to be the target of your beta blockers. So if I prescribe a beta blocker to somebody, I would expect those L-type calcium channels to be affected. So this phase should be affected. And I think you guys are going to go into more detail on those. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all you really have to know for this one right now. Yeah, just uh, what Sarah was saying, like this is really important, right? This is completely different than what happens in the rest of your body, right? Think about it with this situation, you're taking into account volume, right? Because you need that ex that little bit of time to fill up your ventricles. Um, so that's why there's that kind of a delay in the, in the full kind of repolarization process. And that's why they spend so much time focusing in on zero, one, and two. And like Sarah said, and the one that folks often forget, and I often forgot, was four, right? Know those yeah. very well. Um, Real quick before we move on. So I just got a message in the chat. Yes. So phase one, I don't know if I called it rapid repolarization. It's not rapid. <laughs> Sorry. This is your initial repolarization. And if you look at the graph, like we went from depolarization to phase one. So it is your initial repolarizing phase. The phase number three over here, that is your official rapid repolarization phase. So sorry if I confused anyone or if I said the wrong thing. I definitely did not mean to do that. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is just if you guys needed those channels, what's going into where, what direction is it flowing? It's important for you guys to understand that the reason I have these trends is because things are flowing either in or out. So just know these different trends. And that's also in your lecture slides. So you should be able to reference that. And then the next one is just your first aid picture of this. So this is going to give you a more detailed explanation, obviously, and this should be sufficient for like everything you would need to know for this graph. And then we have our other 
graph, which is your pacemaker action potential. So your pacemaker is going to be very highly dependent on your SA and AV nodes, more your SA node, I believe, for this graph. Um, phase zero is this phase over here. So if we're talking about phase zero, that's going to be opening of your voltage gated calcium channels. It's called your upstroke. And that's when you have your voltage gated sodium channels are inactivated um, because there's not as much resting membrane potential, or there's less negative resting, re resting membrane potential of those cells. So it's not influencing those channels to be open at that point. Um, and then it's, so it's going to give you this slow conduction velocity and it's going to be, so your SA node initiates that pacemaker potential. That's where it all starts. And I believe Dr. Toledo, either in MSK or at, in this block, mentioned the concept of automaticity to you guys, just to know that you start, you have all these gap junctions between your cardiac myocytes. So you're going to get the flow of that depolarization starting from that SA node. So it's going to influence the AV node, and then it's going to give you transmission from the atria to the ventricles. This is a concept that I feel like once I understood this concept very well, ECGs and the understanding of what happens during ECGs became more understandable. Because if you can see the flow of the electric um, potential or the electric current, then you can see why you have different types of inflections in your ECGs. Okay, so phase one and two are not in this graph. And that's something that you do have to recognize because they will trip you up. They'll say like which part of your pacemaker action potential graph is represented by like something you would expect in phase one and two of your other graph. So just be able to differentiate between the two. And then phase three is going to be your repolarization phase, and that's going to be associated with your potassium. So you have inactivation of the calcium channels and increase of the potassium channels. So you get more of a potassium efflux, and then that's going to represent your repolarization. So then you end up at phase four. And then phase four is that slow, spontaneous diastolic depolarization, and that's because of the funny channels. And so knowing that the funny channels are going to be mixed sodium potassium inward current is important. And then also just know that it's different from that sodium channel in phase zero of the other action potential graph, because so a lot of people think that that's going to represent their resting membrane potential here. It doesn't because you still have those funny channels that are open and you have things that are flowing back and forth through them. Um, so this is going to account for the automaticity of the SA and AV nodes. And so the slope of phase four, don't think that this is supposed to be a straight line. It does have a slight slope. So it's going to be, um, it's going to determine that heart rate. And I believe you guys should go into more detail on that later on. I don't want to like overwhelm you guys with more information than you need to know at this point. But just understanding that phase four is not completely closed off. You do have those funny channels that are open and sodium and potassium are flowing. Okay, that's pretty much all they need to know for this slide, I believe. And then, okay. So ECGs, again, we're not going to go through all of the slides just because ECGs take a very long time to explain and we have an exam coming up, but let's kind of just scroll through them and I'll like try to point out the important things. So you will go through this in small group, I believe, where they will ask you to calculate a heart rate to explain how you calculated the heart rate. This slide is kind of all you need to know. If this slide isn't sufficient, look up like there's a million YouTube videos that will explain how to do it but pretty much you are counting boxes and that's how you're calculating your heart rate on here on the exam we expected a lot more sorry if you guys can hear the sirens <laughs> um on the exam we expected a lot more ecg stuff it wasn't very representative of how much they emphasized it but i did use one of the ecgs on the exam to calculate heart rate and eliminate an answer and that was literally the extent of my usage of the ECGs on the exam. So don't worry too much about it. Just understand the concepts, understand the general quadrant 
that you're going to land in for your mean electrical axis and then also um, recognize the different types of patterns you would see for the heart blocks and the different rhythms. So for the next slide, it should show this. Okay, so at this part, um, I believe Dr. Toledo taught this lecture. This was a very helpful lecture. He goes through every single one of these waves, every segment, every interval, and gives you time frames. Memorize those time frames because anything outside of those time frames is going to represent some sort of pathology usually. And I believe he talks about those two in the lecture slides. So just recognize it because again, you guys are looking for clinical correlates. You're looking for something they can ask you in a vignette. So the pathologies, anything abnormal is what you're going to look for. Uh, next slide. And then here, so you want to be able to say, okay, the P wave, yes, the P wave is talking about ECG, but it also represents that atrial depolarization phase in my cardiac cycle. For the AV, AV node and the bundle of his delay, that's considered in that PR segment. Your QRS complex is ventricular depolarization. Your ST segment is going to be your ventricles are already totally depolarized. So nothing should be happening at that point. And then your T wave is ventricular repolarization. Um, your TP segment is atrium and ventricles are at resting membrane potential. I don't think they're gonna ask you about TP segment. It's usually something more like QRS or like PR segment and they'll probably ask you about a time frame here or there. The next slide. Okay, I'm not going to go through this because this takes forever. But if you read this, I found this in, I believe, one of the random textbooks that I have. This is a pretty good explanation of how to figure out which quadrant your mean electrical axis is going to land in. And by that, you should be able to figure out what type of pathology you're looking at and I believe they should be listed also here. So if the net deflection is positive in lead one and negative in AVF, then the mean electrical axis is gonna be between zero and negative 90 degrees. Your zero and negative 90, and that's because it's between your lead one and your AVF. You guys can't see my cursor. Sorry, <laughs> give me one sec. Okay, so let's try that again. So this is your lead one. This is your AVF. This is also an AVF. So just be able to follow these instructions over here. And over here, it's going to tell you if it's negative or positive, which direction you're trying to go in. And then once you land in the quadrant you're trying to land in, there are a set, I believe, in your lecture, there should be a set of pathologies you're looking for in those quadrants. It's not as complicated as people make it seem. I thought we would have to be able to calculate the exact axis, but I was reading in one of the books that we don't even have to be able to do that for step one. So you guys are good. Like, just be able to tell which quadrant it is and what could be happening. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Um, Dr. Boudot actually sent me this when we were doing CPR one and I found it kind of helpful also to figure out what was going on. So if this helps you, then by all means, please use it. Um, this is what we mean by your negative and your positive inflections. So being able to recognize those is going to help you immensely in figuring all of like this stuff out over here. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Okay. Acute ischemia, I did not expect this to come up on our exam, but it did. So just recognizing what's happening to your ECG when there is an ischemic attack, that, that will help you a lot. And it'll also give you some of the pathologies for those different segments. So you have in the first couple of hours, you would see peak T waves, ST segment changes. So it's either going to be depression or elevation because you have those two different variations of your MIs. And then within 24 hours, you have T wave inversion and ST segment resolution. So if a patient comes in and it has only been uh, three hours, two hours, then you would expect peak T waves and not inverted T waves. 
So again, this is just how you're going to be able to recognize how much time has passed since this patient has come in. Within a few days, you have that pathological Q wave. I don't think they asked us about that. I don't think they will ask you about that. But if they do, it's there on that slide. So the next slide. Okay, again, and then this is the effect of that injury on the myocardial action potential graph that we were looking at. So in a myo ischemic attack, you're going to have less ATP because that muscle is not functioning correctly at that point. So less ATP means less sodium potassium pump activity because you need ATP for that. And so it's going to shift your graph in this way. Um, I don't remember them asking us about it, but I thought this was actually just interesting. So I threw it in here for you guys, but it's from your lecture slides. So maybe look at it. This is from, I believe, first aid. If not, I don't know where this is from. But again, this is just good practice for you guys to understand what happens during an ST elevated myocardial infarction, which is a STEMI. Okay, next slide. And then these are the ones you want to be able to recognize. So for the exam, we literally just had one of these. I believe there was a vignette that explained it. Uh, I don't remember reading the vignette because I saw VTAC and I decided it was VTAC and that was all I needed. So if you guys can do that, that's great. If um, you need more of an understanding, then hopefully these explanations are good enough. Just be aware that not every one of the patterns that you saw in your lecture slides is represented on these two slides. So make sure you look at that applied ECG DLA and know all of those because I believe VTAC is actually missing from this one. And then can I see the next slide? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no VTAC. So just make sure you guys look at the actual DLA slides because there are more included in there that you should be able to recognize. Um, for your heart block, everybody knows the heart block poem. Everyone in every review session will go over the heart blocks with you guys. So we're not going to, but we just decided to put this in here for you guys if you needed first aid as a reference for it. I believe that should be it. Yeah, that's the poem right there. So we did include it. <laughs> and that's it. So we hope this was helpful. I know it's not as detailed as you guys are used to, but